Thank you. That was really weird. <laughs> and then someone reads something you wrote about yourself. It's like, God, I wish, wish I would have revised that a little bit more. But you know what? That's, that's how things go. Uh, first off, I just want to say uh, thanks to Lane and uh, to Stephanie Myers, Kathy Yamamoto, and uh, Lara Luthi over in uh, uh, Region 7, right? Oh, I forgot to introduce myself. R.T. Duke, Region 7, Boise Education Association. There we go. All right. <laughs> hey. We got some kids in the audience there. All right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is my first time being up here. And uh, this, I'm trying to do something about the uh, mental well-being of educators because uh, it's, it's, it's a very real issue. And, and I hope, you know, uh, the message that I have for you today will resonate. And uh, if it doesn't, you know, I always imagine this when I get in front of my, uh, an auditorium of students or something like that. My last name is Duke. And so oftentimes they'll yell, Duke. And I just pretend if they're booing, they're actually just saying my last name. So if there's any boos out there, I'm just going to pretend that you're saying my last name, all right? So, uh, so let me begin this speech by saying that uh, I have not memorized this speech. Uh, I gave myself some grace, though as this speech is to a union. So I'm calling it the State of the Union. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Labs are welcome. <laughs> you guys are a little different than my two dogs and my cat and my two kids, seven and nine, that are just rolling around not paying attention. So, um, and since the president gets to use a teleprompter, I feel like I'm okay using my printed version. And I hope you'll understand. As humans, we love stories. I often teach with stories about my life and. My students every time love to hear them. My children do too. Recently, I took my kids camping and they wanted to zip up in the tent early and bundle up in their sleeping bags, holding their stuffies tight while I told them scary stories. They aren't really that scary. And I can always tell when I've gone too far because they hide their faces in the worn out fur of their stuffies, eyes pinched shut, hoping it's going to end happily. Noticing this, I'll put in some ridiculous crass humor, such as my fishing friend, who was hearing noises in the dark, peed his pants as two glowing eyes peered at him through the darkness. They laugh and plead, with, uh, plead for another, thankful that my friend wasn't hurt by a curious elk or a friendly raccoon. Now, what I love to watch uh, most is how they gaze up through the netting of the tent and into space, eyes blinking, slowly. And all I want to know is what that story is making them imagine. Are they focused on the stars? Our images dancing through their imagination on the black canvas of dusk. I like that mystery. And when they fall asleep, I'm still awake because it's only 8.30. I make my own stories about what is going on in those curious gazes. The stories are part of being human. But unlike the ones of the blissful warm spring nights camping with my kids, there are other stories that truly frighten and divide. Education has many. James Baldwin. One of the greatest truth tellers that I know gave a speech to a group of teachers in 1963, the same year that Megar Evers was shot. It's a wonderful speech, and one that every one of you should read. The speech was titled, and Talk to Teachers, and the first lines go like this. Let me begin by saying that we're living in a very dangerous time. Everyone in this room is in one way or another aware of that. This is true, right? Everyone in this room feels like, it's gotten all so dangerous. I know many of my colleagues who are afraid to teach certain history concepts, or English teachers who are afraid to read a story about race, or elementary teachers who simply want to read a picture book about acceptance, diversity, and fairness, but still don't feel like they can. Oh, thank you for getting that volume up. I wasn't quite sure if I was hearing it. You guys got me in the back there? OK, good. Yeah, got a thumbs up. OK. It's better than my seniors. They just sit there, they've got senioritis. And just, yeah. Uh, not to mention the assault on libraries. And here's one more. Most of our colleagues and, and I received tourniquet training this year. No explanation why, but we all knew it. We realized that we now become emergency responders. And when the nurse who provided this training told us that many soldiers on the battlefield wore these tourniquets on each limb in case they lost one of those limbs, I realized that the level of danger in our profession, really in our society, had reached new highs or rather, new lows. Now Baldwin's speech goes on to examine the paradox of education, saying simply that the purpose of education is to encourage students to examine the society in which they're being educated. Although, he states, no society is really interested in having those types of people around. And the paradox that he outlined so eloquently in his piece, 
uh, is still prevalent today, donning multiple masks since then. This speech is about taking back your individual story and not letting any outside force or agency or colleague or parent or legislature write a different one about you as professionals, but more importantly, as human beings. Because a lot has been normalized in our profession. A lot has been told about us, and that just isn't so. And it's time to start rewriting that story through our own words, our actions, and our thoughts. But before we do that, let's first look at the story of public education. Education is a paradox. Just look at some of the language that we use, or more aptly, what's being used within the system. No child left behind. Race to the top. I mean, isn't that confusing? If we're not leaving any child behind, how can anyone get to the top? You know, these, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> these language shifts, my kids did not get that one. <laughs> these language shifts happen all the time in our profession. About every five years comes a new linguistic phrase wrapped in hope that's supposedly going to make all the difference. But here's another one, standardized tests. Though we all promote diversity of thought and focus on the whole child, at the end of the day, our students endure standardized tests as if they're products on an assembly line waiting to be measured against some imaginary standard human, despite the vast diversity of all the students in our schools. But here's a good one. In my district, I have a stipend position called a learning lead. Kind of sounds like something you use to train a horse with. Okay, so my inner George Carlin was coming out. And Carlin, who's another uh, truth teller, he, if he were alive today examining the language that we use in education, he'd have a lot to say about it too. And so do I, but we're going to move on. Albert Camus, when giving a graduation speech after the Second World War, said that the years we have gone through have killed something in us. The toll of that line resonates today. This country missed its chance after the pandemic, returning to normal before validating and recognizing how horrific that was for not just educators, but for nurses, doctors, students, first responders, among others. Countries, states, and local districts failed the mental well-being of their people. We never had time to process, to catch our breath, or grieve. And teachers are right there at the top of that list, from a rapid pivot to online learning, to school closures, to hybrid learning, to masks, to sanitation protocols, to grace in these unprecedented times. When these things returned to normal, it was as if nothing had changed. But a lot had for all of us. And I'm not blaming any one group or one district or one leader. Many of us were simply waiting for things to get better. I remember wishing the worst days of the pandemic away, hoping for a return to normalcy as fast as possible. Because most of the pandemic learning, working, and in truth, parenting, was almost unendurable. If we can just make it back to normal, only then we'll be fine. I thought frequently. And when we finally reopened, things were generally back to feeling sane. But I felt a dis-ease. Not a disease, but a dis-ease. As we rolled around out new initiatives to make up for learning loss. And really, how do we lose learning? It's not like if I learn not to touch a hot stove, suddenly I forget to burn my, not burn myself for the rest of my life. All right, that one didn't go as well as I thought it would. So yeah, it was so nice. I'm going to start editing right now. Okay, so. I remember wondering what else was lost besides learning. The truth is that public education lost a lot more than learning. We lost our story. And what was once business as usual now became the urgent matter to get those kids back up to grade level, back to standard. The pundits and politicians lashed onto the crisis as well, recognizing an opportunity to, uh, to uh, bring a full assault on public schools that still rages today. From the critical race theory attacks to censorships, books, and libraries, the offensive had begun at a time when we were at our most vulnerable, our most desperate, and our most burnout. And some of you know, in Goze Adichie's The Danger of a Single Story, it's a speech. But if you don't, the premise is simple. Stories have tremendous power and influence. Stories about groups of people, stories about individuals, stories about ourselves. But when there is a single story, whether it is about a group or an individual, the risk of stereotyping at best and dehumanizing at worst increases immensely. And before, carry, uh, before COVID, the seed of education single story was planted long ago when the nation at risk published in 1983 skewered the profession 
in public education. The story started small, but the seed took root, and a new narrative grew, wielding new language, planting a new story, failing, costly, ineffective, wasteful, now indoctrinating. And all of you sitting here in this room have been flooded with those messages. I sense, and some of my colleagues at least, that some of us have started to believe those things subconsciously, or at least arm up, armor up against those messages. And the language and narrative capture has damaged our profession and the people in it beyond measure. This single story is gaining momentum now. And these stories play directly into the roles that many of us, often without knowing, don like armor to prove that we're not what the opposition says we are. So we become overachievers, public servants, taking that too literally. Martyr, this story puts us on defense. Now the single story is designed to frighten us into these roles because they want us to be scared, want us to be anxious, want to play on the overachievement and sacrifice that we do every day because if we don't, who will? Even worse, they want us to fight against one another. It's actually a noted tactic that dates all the way back to the art of war. Destroy the enemy from within, win the war without even raising a weapon. This story creates fear, anger, frustration, bitterness, and, uh, which are all dividing forces. And they make us separate and force us to react instead of to respond. If we don't do something about it, which we absolutely can, then the opponents have already won. But here's the par hard part about that story. Some of it is true. The education system is broken, but not for the reasons that our, our opponents claim. The years of underfunding and overemphasis on standardized tests, among other things, have led us here. The very, uh, the very things that are wielded against us, our opponents say, uh, use to say that we are failing and ineffective. What's really broken, though, is morale, hope, autonomy, imagination. A recent study by the RAND Corporation, in a recent study, the authors examined the current state of job-related stress among teachers, administrators, and those in other professions. The numbers are heavy, but not surprising. For example, in the survey, 73% of teachers experienced frequent job-related stress. 85% of administrators felt the same way, but compare that to only 35% of workers in other fields who experience the same thing. You see, broken. Moreover, 80% of professionals in other fields felt that they had resilience and, and they could handle the duties of their jobs. And though this word has gained its own dilution recently, that's a large number. Compare that to only 46% of teachers who felt the same way. This study argues that burnout is significantly more of a risk factor in educators than it is for the average working American. Heavy, but not surprising. Among the findings, the main elements were lack of autonomy, more work and less time, and behavior issues from students. Again, broken. Now, as I was writing this speech, one of my best friends shared with me, uh, it's an art form that takes what is broken, vases and ceramics, and reassembles the pieces with veins of silver, gold, and platinum. It's a Japanese art form called kintsugi, literally translated as golden joining. Him sharing this is one of those serendipitous signs from the universe because kintsugi recognizes the beauty of broken things, that art lives in things that we might otherwise see is too damaged to repair. I'd like to think that public education fits this bill. If that's the case, it's the story that needs repair more than anything else. And we are the veins of precious metals that can suture this system back. So let's pay attention to some of the good stuff that's out there about our profession, to alchemize the metal into patches that reassemble these broken pieces into art. I know that where we place our attention is where we place our energy. So let's focus on the good. In 2011, when the Luna Laws, students come first. How about that for gaslighting? <laughs> okay, that was a good one. Okay, I gotta take a, I gotta take a quick pause. If I'm not getting any curse words up here because that's like one of my secret hopes is that there's like a bunch of stars up there and yeah. Never had something like actually say the thing I was saying. It's kind of like my little voice up there is just saying this. Okay, so, all right, where were we? Oh yeah, old Tom Luna, okay, here we go. Uh, when those came about, all seemed lost. Data-driven value-added measurements seemed certain, and our job was going to become more mechanized and at the whims of large corporate standardized tests. But Idaho voters showed up, and they overturned these laws, and it wasn't even close. For that, for a state that is further right than Rush Limbaugh, <laughs> thank you. All right, that was a pretty good one. We got an older audience, so we know this. Yeah, okay. 
the people of Idaho cast their votes for public schools and for us. The story says a lot. How about Luke Mayville and Reclaim Idaho? Let's give them a round of applause. Their efforts to force the legislature to fully fund our schools resulted in a massive windfall of funding, albeit still not enough, for public schools. And this was done by unions and individuals, all fighting for a story that ran contrary to what is so easy to believe, so dominant in the news cycle and in the legislature. People organized, lobbied, gathered signatures, and rallied around this common story and forced our state government to fulfill their constitutional duty to fund our schools. Even more hopeful, is the fact that in multiple surveys, the public, though they may voice their discontent with public education, discontent with public education, still firmly support their students' individual teachers. This is true. And that makes sense. A system versus a human. The system is easy to critique. The human is not. When parents show up to back to school nights or parent-teacher conferences, they often aren't showing up to learn about which standards are going to be taught. They're showing up to see what kind of person you are and how you're going to take care of their child. Now, many of us became educators because teachers that we had in our own experiences, whether it was Ms. Cordoza, my second grade teacher, who instilled in me confidence by telling my parents that I would in some way be in the news for helping me make the world better. So I'm going to ask Lane to put me on the news tonight so she can, we can fulfill that promise, okay? You know, thank you. <laughs> or Mr. Kuglin in fourth grade, who was revolutionary in bringing the news to our classroom with CNN Newsroom in the early 90s. My class was featured on the national news. Or Miss Marcillo in sixth grade, who everyone's single story was that she was a complete nightmare. I even tried to convince my parents not to put me in her class. I begged them. But she turned out to be the person who introduced me to the power of stories and words and books. Or Mr. Gillette, my high school band teacher, who encouraged me to take my skills for being in front of people and to perform as myself, not pretending. These teachers all impacted me in ways that they probably don't even know. And that's the really challenging part about this job. Because you know what I never did? I never told them about the impact they had on me. And paradoxically, I don't feel bad about that because I'm just now at the point where I recognize their impact on me so long ago. But imagine your own students, each one out there not yet ready to realize the impact that you are having on them right now. Most of them will not reach out to you, but these stories are out there every day. When I focus my attention on these things, it's easier for me to see the cynical part of me that is jaded and has lost hope as just that, a part of me, which is also fractured. There are other parts of me that are filled with positive stories, ones that suture my belief in this profession and in public education together with precious metal. Now, somewhere in the Bible it says that without a vision, the people will perish. This is not the end of my speech, although it's going to sound like it's uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, this is the Bible, it says that without a vision, the people will perish. So my vision for public education says this. I envision a group of educators from the classroom teacher to the custodians to the paraprofessional to counselors to principals to superintendents to board members who will cut to the marrow of what matters in education, which is humanity, professionalism, creativity, and curiosity, and fun, and real learning. I envision an inspired collective of people who band together to recapture the story of education from those who would seek to dismantle the last great melting pot in America, which is our public schools. Inspired literally means in spirit. And as much as I know how hard it is right now for all of us, I also envision a system where people's spirits have something to strive toward, not away from. So how do we get there? I believe we need to start by looking, and we ought to study ourselves seriously, uh, looking inward. And we ought to study ourselves seriously to see if we hold any stories of martyrdom, or achievement, people-pleasing, cynicism, or constant complaining. I know there's attempting to do. But hey, many say, it's a job. It's all about the kids, right? I mean, that's why we're doing it. And yeah, I mean, in so many ways, yes. <laughs> but that phrase has been normalized. It's been weaponized in some ways to the point that it is often used against anyone who would speak up about a flawed policy or a need for some sort of disciplinary action, an out of control student. If you speak up, it might say you're against the kids. And that's another paradox. And don't get me wrong, I love teaching because of the students. It remains the best part of the job. 
But I cannot help but wonder what the mentality would be amongst the boots on the grounds, in the trenches, if our leaders at all levels would say that this job is not just about the kids. It's about you too, as humans. And we will do whatever we can to make sure that you want to show up to work every day. We trust you. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that? Yeah. It is, in my view, the leader's primary responsibility. Take care of the people who take care of the kids. If they don't, then we end up in roles like martyr or cynic, who, for many good reasons, take up the cause of education alone and sacrifice so much of their own lives and well-being because they feel alone. Now, whatever story you believe, if you're not careful, without introspection, it can lead to resentment, self-doubt. It leads to loss, loss of work-life balance, loss of lack of boundaries, feeling like we always have to say yes to every request. It leads to showing up too early and leaving too late. It leads to slowly accepting more on our plates and less time to do it. Worse yet, those false stories sometimes lead to substance abuse, sleep issues, inability to interact with your family or friends, high blood pressure, depression, anxiety, and desperation. And these are all things that I've had to face and replace with my own healthier story. And it started with looking inward and my own. So outside of the temple of Apollo and Delphi, where ancient Greeks went to seek the prophecies of the gods, there's inscribed two simple words, know thyself. When people would travel to the oracle to have their fortunes cast, they may have missed these simple words, instructing them to look inside for their fortunes. Know thyself, short, to the point, and simple. When seeking answers, they might say, the key to it all is just knowing yourself. Now, our society is, in general is focused on the exact opposite. We take everything that is not us, our clothes, our roles, our financial status, how we're viewed by others, how we think others view us, what happened, what may happen, uh, and we tie all our, our, our identity to those things. We think constantly about how we must live up to or in spite of what we call me. And so much of that is out of our control. But to know thyself is to look past the external stories that are illusions of ego. Now, I read recently that we think up to 50 to 60,000 thoughts a day. And 98% of those thoughts are the same exact thoughts. And we call those me. Now, habits, these are habits of mind and habits of thought, habits of attention. And that's who most of us think that we are. Now, this may sound confusing to some of you and comforting to others, but you are not your thoughts. You are not the roles that you play, the expectations others have for you, or even the thoughts that you have about yourself. So, what are you? Well, we are, instead, just the observers of our thoughts. Our thoughts are simply objects of our attention. Imagine it this way. You're sitting behind a video camera, controlling what to focus on, what to leave out, where to zoom in, and where to go panoramic. Those 50 to 60,000 thoughts, then, are where you place the focus of your camera for most of your life. This small reframing of who you are can actually help you to really start knowing who you really are, to learn about the mental, emotional, and automatic reactions to the world around you. Because where you place your attention is where you place your energy. Religion, spiritualism, psychology, and even more recently, neuroscience are all beginning to converge on this same conclusion. Now, it took me a long time to figure this out. And if, you, and if I've lost you completely, then let me try to just get you back a little bit, okay? You might be asking yourself, well, why is it so important to know myself? It's not me who's the problem. It's this thing or that policy that's causing me stress and anxiety. And I don't disagree with you. When we are conditioned, which we are, to look outward for validation, for satisfaction, these external circumstances 100% cause us suffering. But there's another way to live beyond hoping that things that are almost entirely out of our control will change. It all starts starting to figure out who you are. A common trait of suffering is the concept of if only. We humans do it all the time. It sounds like this. If the legislature would just change, only then I will be happy. Okay, I know that would be actually really true, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not Sonia. Okay. Or if the district policy would change, only then will I be happy. Or if my own children would stop leaving empty cups around my house, only then will I be happy. You see, we have so many conditions on our happiness that the world can never meet all of these demands. It's impossible to have every one 
of our preferences perfectly aligned and present all the time and expect everything to go our way. Mainly because most of it is completely out of our control. Well, maybe not the cup thing, but my children are slow to change with such difficult tasks as just putting cups in the damn dishwasher. <laughs> Seriously, there's like 10 each day. I'm just like, we're gonna throw them in there, okay. So if it feels so overwhelming, all is so impossible, why not start looking at yourself to see what's really going on inside when that's the only true thing that we can change. It took me a while to figure this out for myself. One that wasn't tied to what others thought about me, but when I started looking inward, I had to go way back to childhood. And there's an old saying by Mark Twain that goes like this. Actually, it's misattributed to Mark Twain, but I'm just gonna say it's him because I like it. <laughs> it ain't what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And the more I looked at the stories that I thought were me, the more I realized that they were not true. Looking inward, I started to become aware of them. I'm not good enough. I'm a mediocre teacher. I'm an imposter. Or everyone has to like me. Or I'll fail as a parent. Now, 98% of 60,000 thoughts means that 58,800 thoughts that I had every day, most of them completely below my awareness, were running my life. And I didn't even realize it. And the worst part was, they weren't true. Now, with the help of a counselor and a ton of reading and listening, studying, and journaling, I realized that my story started back at schoolyard bullies, to being raised by two parents with their own mental, uh, mental health issues, and, of course, the damaging single story of education. But that quest to know myself, separate my thoughts from my past, led me to my true values. Creativity, connectedness, confidence, curiosity, compassion, all of these things for myself and for others. These values changed my life, and I had begun to write a new story for myself. Now I believe, actually I know, that a group of people, a union, who turn their lenses inward can do a whole lot more about the problems of the world if they can act from a place of strength and confidence, equanimity and peace, clarity and purpose. I know this because I was in a dark spot about two years ago. I have reference that in here. I spent a lot of time, especially over this summer, trying to figure out things for myself, trying to figure out why I felt so bad when my life, just, everything just felt so good, or was so good, seemingly on the outside. And I spent time to time this summer, I was feeling really good, and came back to August, you know, our training days. And I was so excited to see all my colleagues and just like start getting ready for the next year. And I noticed in my colleagues, um, there was just some stress already, and we haven't even started yet. And you know, as I was learning lead, um, I, uh, I asked my principal, and to her credit, I said, hey, you know, we got this uh, uh, trainings every morning, and on, uh, like in our district, we got two, uh, quarter two and quarter three. Uh, they're called collaborative learning communities. And um, we could get to choose what we want to do in those two quarters. And so I proposed to my principal, um, hey, you know, I've, I've been doing some stuff, and I think I could like, show some other people some strategies and ideas to help them out. And uh, to her credit, she said, yeah, you just got to sign up three people. And if those three people show up, then you're good. And if they don't, you got to figure something else out. So I'd spent a little bit of time writing up an email and uh, sent out a form. And um, to my surprise, you know, I was hoping for about 10. I had 45 people sign up for that, that quarter two uh, workshops, I guess is what I call them. And, um, you know, we learned a lot about just strategies and starting to figure things out. And I know for sure that, like, it's, it didn't change people's outward lives. But I think people, most of the people that were there, um, the, the common phrase that they said was this. It was just nice to know that they weren't the only ones feeling the way that they were feeling. And it was a cool thing. And so uh, it was so good, my principal said, hey, this is going really well. Do that quarter three. So I got to do it another round, and that was really cool. Um, and, and, and all that, that I've learned is really that we all know that we have a mental health crisis with students, right? But we know that's out there. We got to do something about that, too. My argument is it's not education's job alone to fix that. We're a huge part of it, right? But what we can do to help our students and what we can do to help the process is start figuring out how to do that for ourselves. And that's my argument with this. So I know my time's winding down. I ripped a little bit, Lane, so I hope I'm uh, still on that time. So I want to encourage you to start paying attention to some of the thoughts that you have about you. And that's the first step to crafting your own narrative. But writing a new story for yourself it's going to be uncomfortable. It wasn't for me. I had to face years of subconscious thoughts and emotions, turn towards them instead of away from them, to listen to them instead of trying to block them out. 
But in doing so, these stories lost their grip on me. They weren't me. They were like armor that I used to protect myself. And doing this for yourself will free up space for your attention to shift to better thoughts and better things. And like a child, parts of you just need to be listened to, heard, and acknowledged. And you can let those things go that need protection. And instead of hiding in a sleeping bag, familiar fur of a stuffy press close to your face, you can look up at the stars and start painting a new images, crafting new stories that lead you to your inner values and to your inner strength. There will be parts of you that are scared and anxious, jaded and burned out. But these stories are not you. And you can author a whole new narrative, one that says, I'm done being scared of things that won't kill me. One that says, I'm done being anxious or angry over things that I cannot control. And how I feel is far more important than anything else. And I'm going to focus on that more than anything else. It sounds so selfish, but I promise you it's not. It's where you have to start. Now, I hope districts will recognize this, that, that this is needed, not just for all of you, but for themselves too, because we all need this. We all have to hear the same sinister story that's being told us about, about us right now. We're on the same team. And real change can come if we do that. I know this. Change the world by first changing yourself. It's possible. And I aim to add a verse to this profession that we can all get behind. So let me sum it all up. I know that no real change can happen in our system, or any system for that matter, without each person looking inward to master themselves. It cannot. Now, it may seem like a paradox to hear this. We are altruists and humanists in education. But I urge you all to step into your own stories. Find your role as a protagonist. Cultivate your garden with life and strength and courage, curiosity. Recognize the weeds for what they are. Let bastards be bastards. I hope it put that up there. And we will face the spurious single story together. It is time, as Ralph Waldo Emerson said, to work and learn in evil days, in insulted days, in days of debt and depression, calamity. It is time, he continues, to fight best in the shade of the cloud of arrows. Because if we don't, the other side will destroy what we have put so much of our time and energy and lives into. And there has never been a more important, very dangerous time for all of us to get to know ourselves and start crafting our own stories. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I guess I should have stayed up there longer. I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.